This is the Besotted Pride of West London podcast. We're coming to you probably a day late, but it's been a busy old week. It's, it's, I can't believe it's, it seems like the week has been a month, if I'm honest with you. Yeah, two podcasts last week. We did the uh, Ivan Tony special and then we did like the weekly one. Um, secondly, the post match against uh, Crystal Palace and the post match against Newport County. And it's just been a bit of a blur. So, uh, yeah, I, I th- Thursday night out for a Friday morning. Morning, go live I think is the order of the week this week uh, it's just yeah it's just been crazy that uh, Ivan Tony was such a big storm last week but it seems to have all died down a little bit he's signed to a new agency as well which was the late news after the diary of a CEO podcast so uh, yeah there's the, it ramped up even more the uh, you know the talk about him wanting to go on going and you know this 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 will be his last year at, at the club and he'll probably go in January. Anyway, enough of all that. We've got enough we've got a really busy one tonight because we're on transfer deadline. You anyone that's put Sky on or anyone that's listened to Radio Five, you're just gonna get blown away with uh news about transfers it's 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 going crazy out there um and it's going crazy uh in twa as well some of the bids that have gone in over the last couple of weeks have been eye-watering i never thought i'd see these numbers in my lifetime but you know they that's that's where we're at now we're we're, we're at the best league in the world and um, we're surrounded by some of the best players in the world and the transfer fees are the hugest in the world astronomical so, uh, yeah, we just had a, a bid of 34.2 million euros put in for Johan Bakayoko from PSV Eindhoven. That seems to be uh, gathering pace. We'll, we'll see. Um, we'll see if that comes over the line. But um, there's other transfer speculation we'll talk about in a little bit. <clears throat> so, lots to talk about tonight. And I'm Dave Lane. And joining me tonight, we'll have Mark Bonner. How are you, Mark? Hi, good. Good, everyone. Yeah, nice to be here. Nice to have you on board again. And Charlie Briggs. Charlie, how's things with you, buddy? All good, mate. All good. Yeah, excited for the Bournemouth game. So, uh, got to get through the rest of the week first, but no, very excited. Yeah, that's almost like it's, it's, the Bournemouth match is almost like a sidetrack to what else is going on because, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've got, you know, look at Wheeler. We're going to look back in a minute to the Crystal Palace game, um, but Bournemouth is, you know, a real opportunity to put kind of a couple of results right I think I think we sort of uh, you know the consensus after the game on Saturday just gone was we you know there was two points dropped and you know at Newport though it's difficult to kind of work out really you know how good or how bad are you playing um, when you when you change so many te- um, team team players you know we, we really made hard work of that but we'll you know let's just let's actually just go back to Crystal Palace because <clears throat> We, we started off that game, I thought, really, really well in a really positive mindset. We had, uh, you know, Sharda playing in his number nine role, really super excited about seeing how he develops. And he capped a really great first half with a really superb goal. Talk us through that goal, Mark, because it, it, we'd waited a while for, for him to score and we've waited for him to kind of fully sees his, his opportunity because he's, he's come in with, with um, you know, a lot of potential and that he's another Brentford signing, isn't he? He's one of those that we're, we're, we're going to kind of turn into, you know, uh, a much, much more improved version of, of, of how, how, how he arrives. But that was, that was some statement, wasn't it, Mark? Yeah, no, it was a, it was a fine, fine finish, wasn't it? I mean, he, you know, he picked the ball up, didn't he? Wide on the left, he just... You know, head down. Um, he just seemed to sort of um, tear towards the penalty spot, didn't he? Bit of twisting and turning. Got the ball on his right foot, and he absolutely lashed it into the into the far left side of the net, didn't he? Uh, beyond the keeper, and you know, it was a fine curving finish, really. Um, I was really pleased for him. I mean, you could see the determination in the run and in the finish. Um, I mean, it felt like he leapt, you know, twice his own height in the air to sort of celebrate, didn't he? And um, it was a great goal, great first goal. And um, I've got a really good feeling about him. I think he's going to be a really fine player for us. I mean, he's a young lad. He's got a good attitude. He was great in the interview. Um, so, yeah, I'm just excited about it, really. I mean, 
seeing him start through the middle is exciting, but actually he picked the ball up sort of in the Ollie Watkins position, didn't he? And, um, you know, it felt like they were all moving around up there in the first part of that game. Uh, actually quite a fluid front three, which I'm quite excited about. I actually think all three of them can play through the middle. So it's it's interesting. But in the end, I think, you know, come January, we're going to see Shardé through the middle, aren't we? Yeah, it looks that way. <clears throat> and you mentioned his celebration there, and we have to, we have to we have to tip our hat to Lloyd Awusu because uh, I, I texted Lloyd Awusu um, at half time and said, Lloyd, have you, did you copyright your raising the roof? Because if you, I mean, I, I guess everyone that's listening to this has seen how Sharda um, <clears throat> celebrated. He did the Lloyd Awusu both hands above his head and pump, pumping up and down, really like pushing the roof up, and. Um, Lloyd Awusu used to do that. He did it for several years, and then he came back for a second second term at the club, and we saw the same uh, same celebrations once or twice. Not as prolific as he was the first time, but you know, <clears throat> he, he 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 will always have a special place in the hearts of uh, Brentford fans of of that of that era. The late the late the late nineteen nineties were were kind of Lloyd's Lloyd's time. And you know, anyone that was at um, Cambridge for the final day of that season, when he scored the goal that um, yeah. took us up as champions, again, you know, it was uh, a, a day that makes, still makes the hairs on my arms stand on end. You know, we're in a different, different, completely different ballpark now, literally. So, Charlie, you know, did you, you know, after we'd, we'd gone a goal up, were you expecting us to kind of build on that? Because it, it, that's what it felt like to me. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree with you. I thought we started really well, um, which actually has been a bit of a theme of us in the Premier League. I think we tend to sort of have a superb first 20 minutes and then things kind of tail off towards the back end of a first half. But yeah, I thought we'd we'd press on. I think Palace are one of those teams I'm always a bit cautious of. I think we, obviously, we consistently draw 1-1 one, one with them. Um, so I think I was probably going into the game, to be honest, expecting a draw. Um, and they played so well against Arsenal Palace that, you know, a fight back wasn't at all kind of impossible um, but I agree I think we were in the position to have won the game I think their goal was just rather scrappy it was a bit of a straight one to concede it's still I've watched the replay a couple of times I still don't really know what happened uh, looks like a bit of confusion between Flecken and Collins but it happens um, and actually it's quite a good finish from Anderson under Flecken's legs um, but yeah I was expecting to go on and win it but I, you know it, it's Crystal Palace I think we, we can get carried away but they're a strong side they look bloody good against Arsenal um, and yeah whilst it feels like two points dropped I think to be honest I'd have taken a point at the start of the game yeah, yeah, I agree. You couldn't really point the finger at anyone. It was, it, 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 I've, I've looked at it and thought, mm, Collins should have just instead of jumping over it, he should have just hoofed it out. But you know, it was, it was every, all three of them kind of converged at the same time. And obviously, you yeah. want someone to do something. But you know, it, it, on another day, he doesn't go. You know, Anderson gets his toe to it, and it, it you know, goes straight into the keeper's shins or something. But it you know it was just a, a bit of a lucky sort of break for them but in the end I, I did you think we were kind of hanging on for the point I know I know we I know we um kind of I know we pushed on a little bit more after they'd equalized but once we conceded I, I felt that we could concede again they they obviously had a little more belief about them so was a point kind of fair result in the end or was it definitely two points dropped for us Mark I think we were quite flat in the second half, to be honest. I mean, I think probably for 25 minutes, if not 30, really they had the better of the second half. And, you know, we were, you know, we, we were hanging in there a bit. Um, the goal felt like it was coming, felt like they were going to equalise. And we only really picked it up in the last seven, eight minutes, really. Um, so actually, to me, it was a clear um, Palace second half, really. I felt we were quite... You know, we were quite lacklustre for most of that second half. I was disappointed in the performance really in the second half because the game was there. You know, um, you know, it was totally three points available to us, and you know, it's disappointing really. So yeah, I mean, I just felt Palace were on it. I think um, Roy, you know, made a couple of good substitutions, got them going. They came out strongly, and I think they just got the better of us really for a large chunk of that second half yeah so let's 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 go back to uh, the terraces the post-match 
post-match vibe briefly and hear what the Brentford fans thought after the one-all draw against Crystal Palace. I'm a bit flat after that, Laney, to be honest. I thought, yeah, first half was good. Um, probably need to get that second goal, which we didn't, but didn't carve out enough, really. A good goal from Sharda, but again, didn't, didn't show as much maybe as we'd like. And I thought we sort of lost, lost our way in the second half and gave them too much possession and they got some good play. I'll have to see the goal again, can't comment on the goal, looked a bit, a bit scrappy. And then you know, finally at the end when we did go for it, we looked like we could score, you know, another couple of minutes, I think we probably would. Whistle was quiet today, didn't really have a chance. They did a job on Brian. I thought their tactics were quite good, they did a job on Jensen. You know, crazy when he got the ball, but they closed him quickly. But Brian didn't get a lot of time on the ball either until the end when he broke through. But yeah, it, it's, it's OK, right? It's OK, but it's not. I think it's two points dropped if you consider the first half. Well, I thought we were the better team, but second half, they really came us. I thought they were a very good second half. And uh, I really, really do like their two centre-backs, uh, Anderson and Gooey. You're not going to beat Anderson in the air. Gooey on the ground is superb. Uh, I think they're two really good centre-halves. I've always liked them. Yeah, I think, I think the, the one one's probably deserved. Sit, literally, first half, we were better. Second half, they were better. Second part of the second half where they could have, you know, they were putting us under it a little bit. And so... I suppose you look at that and think maybe it's a point game, but definitely two points drop for me because I, I just think they're quite a cynical side, Palace. You know, I, they're, they're quite a dull side to watch apart from the front three. Um, and I don't think we were given any favours by the referee who didn't seem to lose track of what the rules actually were a lot of the time. And that, that affects you when you're playing football. You know, you don't know what you can do and what you can't do. That was a battle for a team in between teams who will finish at the end of the season between 8th and 12th in the league. And probably that was a refle- fair re- scoreline reflection. I mean, looks uh, we, we'll have to see uh, on match of the day what happened with the goal because it was a long way. It was at the other end of the ground. But it looked like it did go through Flecken's legs. But did it get a deflection or not? Too early to say. We'll have to see what it, what it does. Charlie looked good today when he, when he was on the pitch for the 70 minutes. Great, great goal. And hopefully that will give him all the encouragement in the world that he needs, needs to go on. I, I thought we faded quite badly in the second half. I, I can't argue with the draw. It was the right result. Uh, I mean, watching the goal back... Yeah, you were right. I thought it was a tackle that turned into a shot. But it's not. It's... Uh, Collins jumps it thinking the keeper's going to get there and um, neither of them quite get there and Anderson just rolls it under them but before that you know Flecken saved the free kick brilliant save by the way uh, and then the double save even better so you know and then puts to bed any doubts about Flecken people expressing but you know when you look at the bench today when you look at the players who aren't available at the moment I mean when Jensen goes off we lose control of the midfield we lose control of the match Damsgaard's the natural sub he wasn't available um, and you had a bunch of other players, Baptiste, uh, De Silva, who are out. You, this is the difference between draws and wins with this team. We use our subs normally. We bring four or five on, and that gets us over the line. We didn't have the subs to do it today, and that's why we faded and, and sort of lost control of the match. It was, it's, you know, it's the El Jorico episode five. This is, I predicted it before the game. Of course we drew with Palace. But I, I just felt today was like a game where I, I thought sta- I thought Palace are, I, I think they're a bog standard physical Premier League side with a manager who, who, who was quite happy for them to play that way. And the first half proved we are better than Crystal Palace. In the second half, we kind of played as if we thought we weren't better than Crystal Palace. We let Palace score, and then we have a bit of a bit of a huff and a puff at the end, and and, and it just feels to me like it was a big opportunity lost. I, I, I think you take three points today, and you sort of stamp your authority a bit, don't you? There you have it. Um, pretty much everyone's on the same same uh, wavelength there. I, it, it was just it was a mixture of a, a bit of frustration and uh, a, just a little bit of kind of what could what might have been I think because you know it had been such a positive week the, the week before you know at, at Fulham away we 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 all hoped that we could kind of build build from that and uh, you know just just that would give us a confidence and spur us on to another three points and obviously you know we both we've all said didn't we that Palace seem to be the, the the team that we're we kind of like we're kind of tied to we can't really we can't really beat them and they can't really beat us but we actually think we're probably a better team than them and I, and I don't think there's much of a probably about that to be honest I think we are but they just seem to they seem to have a lot more kind of maybe maybe experience and uh, just yeah they, they know how to grind out a result that's why they've been in this league for as long as they have so 11th or 12th year 
So uh, yeah, there's certainly no mugs. <clears throat> and that that took us into uh, the Tuesday night's trip down to South Wales because uh, that was that was a real old school Brentford away day. There was there was a really good Brentford turnout uh, going across the uh, the Severn Bridge and uh, into Newport. So it's a it's a journey we you know a lot of us have made several times to Somerton Park and this time to Rodney Parade. Uh, you know we were looking back to a great cup game against Newport when we beat them in the Freight Rover Trophy at, at, at Griffin Park, a pack Friday night it was at Griffin Park in 1985. Um, we, we won 6-1, was it 6-0, 6-1. Um, Gary, yeah. Robert, Gary Roberts scored a uh, hat-trick at either side of half-time and it was, it was just, it was one of the last times I remember seeing the Royal Oak uh, packs and it was just a really great atmosphere, an early kind of experience of you know, it felt like the big time, but little did we know that we were going to get to Wembley and uh, roll over to Wigan. So, yeah, going to going to uh, Newport was was very nostalgic, I'd say. Um, we had a really good day out, really good turnout of bees, as I said, um, and our crew. There was there was yeah, loads went, and uh, you know, people went on you know, a lot of work meetings that people were calling in South Wales. I, I don't know, it was just coincidence, I think. But um, yeah, there was a lot, there was a lot of plotting up that was going on just to make sure that they could get there without taking time off work um, and we all stayed in the in the same hotel and uh, it was it ended up being quite a messy Tuesday night so uh, it was it was yeah to, to be encouraged to go there again and uh, the reward was was to uh, to play Arsenal at our place which is uh, a mouthwatering one um, so but the game itself I don't think Brentford really did themselves a lot of a lot of justice. Again, I, it seemed to be uh, we were still in the Crystal Palace mode. Loads of changes. Um, it was a, it was a, it was a very very experimental team. We brought some big guns on towards the end, um, which looked like it pushed us over the line. But they took us to penalties. What did you what did you two make of the game, Mark? From your from your point of view, did you did you think we there was a chance of us going out at, at one stage? Definitely, 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 definitely. It, had, uh, it was a Rotherham game last season, wasn't it? It had that feeling about it. Oh, Gillingham. Gillingham, that's right. Gillingham at home. It had that feeling about it, you know, going all the way to Pens. And I just I just felt we, yeah, I agree that we just carried on in that same vibe that we had in the second half against Palace, even though there were a bunch of changes. But I don't know, I just felt like we were quite flat. I mean, on commentary, the game sounded... You know, um, Newport were bang up for it. The crowd were up, um, and they were very partisan. The crowd it was really making me smile on commentary. You know, there was a lot, a lot of difficult stuff for, for good old Mark Burridge to kind of try and cover over. There was a lot of uh, fruity language, but um, it was like you say, it was a real old school game and um, brought back a lot of nice memories for me. I also remember that uh, Freight Rover semi as well, and um, yeah, I just felt. You know, we were a little bit flat. There were a lot of changes, as you say. Uh, we never really got to grips with it. Felt like one of those games where there was a lot of head tennis. Um, and um, Newport were just quite at, up and at us, really. Um, but, I mean, I was pleased to see Jensen bundle it in, you know, with a couple of minutes to go. But I never felt like it was classic Brentford stuff. I never felt like we, you know, it was over. Because, you know, they were still pouring forward. Yeah, well, you, you probably heard and, and saw a lot more than I did because um, the floodlights were so, were so awful. I said it on the post-match. It, I, I literally couldn't see a lot of the time. And, you know, when the ball went up in the air, you literally lost it. You lost the ball. And that was just from, you know, I'm, I'm sure, uh, hopefully they saw, they could see a little bit more on, on the pitch. If they didn't, it might explain, explain quite a lot. But, the, but Charlie, the, so the, the starting lineup, you know, Ellery er, er, Ball coming goal, um, left back was Christopher Ayer, which was um, unusual. Um, ben Mee and um, Zanka as the centre backs, uh, Roslev on the right, Yarmolek um, and Ye Vitali Yanel and Franco Nyeka as the midfield, and then Ola Kigby and Sharda and Lewis Potter um, on the wings. Did you think that there should have been enough about us to 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 have won this without without sort of going to you know, added added time? 
I think on paper, uh, yes. But I think I've been through this so many times in Brentford. I think it's it's strange the cup because as soon as the first round comes out, comes out and we get one of these slightly lower level teams, it's always seen as a really good chance to see some of the slightly more kind of or players that play less essentially the squad players. Also, some youth players coming through. I know, I'm sure you two, Ola Kigbe, I thought looked absolutely fantastic in pre-season. Um, so I was really excited, knew that he'd start. Um, but it seems to be the way that quite often when you have these sort of squads where there's big rotation, it is just quite hard to get going. It's players who haven't really played together that often. Um, no one particularly knows what their role is in the team. Um, and, you know, we were missing some big players, I think. It's always going to be difficult going into a game with with essentially a completely new back four, um, new goalkeeper. There's a lot of different things going on. Um, uh, I thought, from what I saw, I thought, I thought we, yeah, I thought we we didn't play brilliantly. I thought there were some some sort of bright sparks. Sort of looking, they look really good at points. Um, but it does just seem to be the way that when we get these lower lower league teams, we we play a lot of these squad players who you'd maybe expect to step up. Um, but, you know, it's, it's never quite as easy as that. So it's always it always feels a bit flat, but I think it's just, it's just the cup, really, isn't it? And, and they'll have been bang up for it. So it just happens, really. But, um, but yeah, on paper, I'd say we probably should have should have got the win. <laughs> yeah, should have done. Well, we, we, you know, <clears throat> fortunately we did. And, you know, we've got Ellery Balkum to thank, really, for, uh, for the Arsenal home match. And I, I think it was lovely to see um, <clears throat> Thomas Frank kind of with his arm around the young goalkeeper well not so young goalkeeper anymore but he's still young and um, and kind of lead him to the away end and kind of you know allow <clears throat> Ellery to, to, to enjoy his moment uh, you know his, 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 his moment under the spotlight because he he didn't do a lot wrong at all during the game I mean not that they created masses uh, he, he couldn't really do anything for the goal. It was a really good cross in and a, and a decent header that kind of went past him before he had a chance to move. And, you know, he had a, a little... Well, he, he didn't have a bit of luck. We had a bit of luck that the first penalty they took hit the base of the post and that went away to safety. But then he saved the next two to his right. And, uh, you know, similar saves to one another, actually. And uh, you know our penalty takers were were lethal. All, all three, all three were converted, and mm. um, it was um, it was um, KLP that that stepped up to to to, to, to you know to, to get the the penalty that actually won us won us the tie. So it I, I would you know we've heard a lot about Eric Borkham. He's he's been out on loan a lot. He's been you know obviously. Given extended contracts, so he's obviously a, a goalkeeper that we rate highly. Do you think that will kind of catapult him a little bit more further up into the like, like the manager and the head coach's um, thoughts and, and have a little bit more confidence in him? Yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, he looks to be, um, you know, with Sukrosha sort of a little bit flaky, he looks to be uh, Thomas's sort of number two, doesn't he? I mean, he, he was on the bench, wasn't he, uh, against Palace, I think. And, you know, it looks like he's backing him. And I feel like the last couple of seasons, we've sort of seen that um, Thomas makes his choices for the for the cup. And I think he's probably earned the right to start the next one. And um, probably he will be the cup keeper. And, you know, it'd be good to see how he, how he does. I mean, it's, it's a great story, isn't it? Because he's been at the club since he was eight years old. And he's been close to number two and then got out on load and come back again. And it's great to see him sort of back in the fold. There's a lot of good stuff written about him, about his talent when he was younger. So, you know, we might have a really, a really good keeper there. You know, I know we've got Matthew Cox out on loan as well. Felt like we've got strong homegrown options, you know, bubbling away, which is good. What did you think, Charlie? Is there any other any other standouts, any other kind of like highlights for you from from Tuesday night? Not not hugely, but I think uh, for me anyway, I think Ellery Balkan is is kind of exactly what you want from a first round cup game of of one sort of success story of a youth player. Um, I don't know if either of you saw his Instagram posts after, but he was clearly absolutely chuffed with how things went. He was sharing everything that got sent to him. He was absolutely loving it. Um, and, and more than anything, it's really nice to see. I, I think I probably agree with Mark. I think he's probably probably a bit of a way off kind of first team selection. Um, but you know, Strakosha seems to be injured almost every other week at the minute. So I imagine Balcom's probably going to end up getting a fair bit of time on the bench. And, and I don't think he'll have done himself any harm um, any harm last night. I think in, in terms of other 
positives. Really good to see Ben Mee back out there. Um, obviously, superb last year. And, and it almost feels a bit strange that Collins has maybe come in and taken his starting spot because... I think there's definitely an argument that me was probably our best player last season. Um, so it's it's a difficult one. I think that Balcom's definitely the main positive, but but definitely seeing Ben Mee back out on the pitch is, is great. Um, and, and I'm sure he'll he'll have a fair bit to add this season. Yeah, nice one. Um, so before we move on, um, we also go back to Rodney Parade. Well, let's go back there in audio form. I don't really don't want to go back there physically for, for <laughs> may, maybe forever, but um, no, no offence, no, but uh, I'll just, uh, yes, I'll leave, I'll, I'll leave that and move on. So you know, let's go back to the terraces and just listen to a little bit of the penalty shootout. Uh, certainly 7% possession. Um, it's an, oh, it's the league, league Cup, round one, whatever, who cares really, but obviously we want to win, but all that possession, just make you worry about the depth and army field creativity. But hey, first penalty gonna, is coming what up. What are we going to do? Talk sport. Let's do, let's do talk sport together. So, um, okay, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm Jim Weiss and I'm terribly excited by this. So, so, um, so Balkum, Balkum's in goal and then their player's coming up to... Sc- this player steps up and scores. And no, his, no, he doesn't. He's hit the post. Oh, I don't believe it. I don't believe it, Jim. He's hit the post. Oh. Eric El- Elry Balkum has, has, was beaten. He went the wrong way, but he hit the base of the post. So um, Brentford come up. Brian and Bumo comes up to put us one 0 ahead. I'm hoping. He 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 actually looked like he, he looked like a different class when he came on. To be honest, yeah, Brian and Bumo. He really made a difference, didn't he, Bumo? Like the, the one player who came on, you thought this is a. A man who's playing above his level, but we, I've said that now he's going to miss. Oh, he's <laughs> placed the ball up. on the spot. Brian doesn't miss. And Don't worry about that. Brian, who's been learning off of Ivan Tony, and he's stepping up now. Will he put us ahead in this penalty shootout? Yes, he has. Brian and Bumo, three out of three penalties so far for him this season. Oh, isn't this exciting, Jim? Well, it's only the courage of conviction, the Dave. This may be a sign could Jordan, by the way. Yeah. Well, is he, is he for real? Is he for real? Has he got the courage of conviction? I think he has. But when I was at Crystal Palace, he did, uh, sorry. Uh, so that. here he comes, the amber, the amber demon, the second penalty taker, the the Newport number five, I think it is. It's my eyesight. Right, no, 22. 22. <laughs> Eric Brookham, will he save all of them tonight? Yes! He has saved it! Eric Brookham has saved it! So, so they have missed their first two penalties, where Brentford have scored their first one. I, 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 you, you, you liking my commentary on this? So, Jim? so, so I'm following. Dave. So that basically means it's one nil on penalties to Brentford. And this is stepping up now. And this is, uh, I believe, Johan Visser. Johan Visser. I've from, heard of him. From the Premier League. I've heard of him from the DRC. He's going to smash it. And he is going to score. And Brentford are 2-0 up. That is now 2-0 to Brentford on penalty. That's Brentford 2, Newport 0. If only you would have done this in 90 minutes, we would have been back in the pub by now. So, Ellery. So, um, this reminds me of Richard Lee against Everton, where he saves uh, quite a few penalties. Don't worry. <laughs> no, no, that, that's a long time ago With now. Ellery and go. It's going to be all right. Oh. So here he comes, the number whatever he is. One. Yeah, he's gonna, he's, he can't miss another one, can he? He can't miss another one, surely. Or can they? Yes, he can! Ellery Balkin, he made another save, dives to his right. So Brentford basically have to score this one and they've won. David, it's uh, still Newport, it's still, still two. It's still in the mixer. If we anything can happen. If we if we fuck it up from here. We really are in all kinds of trouble. We to lose. So, Matty Jensen, who's scored in the normal time, in regulation no, 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 no. time. Again, your glasses are not working. That's Keen Lewis Potter. Oh, is it? Keen Lewis Potter. I said my eyes don't work. So, just another one. He's never scored for Brentford, has he? Uh, he has and he has now. Brentford are through. And Brentford are in the cup for the... Oh, easy, easy. So, Brentford win the World Cup. 
here in Wales. The it's in the, the continental in, game of the football. We, we wanted European football this year and we've got it. And we've got it. But American football, we got Welsh football, amazing. And, and, uh, Ellery Balkham has waited 25 years for his moment, son. Uh, well done, Brentford, actually. They, um, they, we, we thought they screwed it and they hadn't. We, the, the class came through in the end. We've talked about Palace. We've talked about Newport. Before we move on to the transfers, let's, let's, I feel a bit funky. You, you two, how, how are you feeling? You, you feeling funky, Mark? Always, always, always. Are you, Charlie, what, are you more factual or are you more funky? I'm bloody funky, as ever. Okay, it's Thursday well, night, Dave. All right, well, I'll, I'll, be the fact, I'll be the facty one. So between us, we're going to get some facts and funk from JB and uh, we're, everyone's going to be happy. Take it away, JB. Jonathan Birchall here again. Last season, we were knocked out of the League Cup 6-5 by Gillingham. The only time to date that the first 11 penalties were scored in one of our shootouts. At Newport on Tuesday, Ellery Balcom was the hero as he followed up on Newport's first miss with two penalty saves to see us through to round three, 3-0 on penalties. He's only now second goalkeeper to keep a clean sheet in one of our 29 penalty shootouts. The other was Graham Benstead in a 1991 Leyland Daft Cup match, ironically also against Welsh opposition, on that occasion Wrexham, where he saved all three of the penalties that he faced. Back to Saturday, where we recorded a fifth successive draw against Crystal Palace. In our previous 30 league meetings, we had just four draws, and none at all in our first 14 league meetings. Thomas announced an unchanged starting 11 from the Fulham game, that was something he didn't do for successive Premier League games at all last season. Another change was without Josh De Silva through injury. He was the only player last season to be in the matchday squad for all our 38 league games and our three cup matches. Sam Angodos returned to the club this week, starting a second spell. He is following in the footsteps of players like George Francis, Roger Cross, Gordon Sweetser, Stan Bowles, Bob Booker, Paul Pretty, Marcus Gale, Nicky Forster and Zanka but he has still some way to go to beat John Doherty, who signed three times as a player in 1959, 65 and 70. He then went on to be appointed manager in 1975, before in 1984 he returned as assistant manager when he joined the club for a record fifth time. There you go, Jonathan Birchall again. He's, he, he, he never, he never, he never, Fails to deliver that man. Well done. Thank you ever so much for sending that through again, JB, and looking forward to some more facts and some more funk from you next week. Before we talk about transfers, um, the England squad was was announced, and we were kind of hoping after the start of the season um, that he's had that Rico Henry would would be named. Now maybe that's a bit naive of us because we've we've been disappointed time after time. When uh, when Southgate names his England's um, his England squads, that you know he just overlooks uh, a player that's you know as honest as the day is long. He's one of the fastest players I, I've I've seen in a B shirt, and he just gives his all. And he's he's just one of the the, the, the highest performers I think um, in in the Premier League this season. I, 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 that's not an exaggeration. I know if we're blinking because he's our player. But he's, he's clearly improved and he's, he's clearly added something more to his game. Um, you know, if you if you could if you could criticise him slightly in the past, it's been you know his, his final ball and his delivery and getting into an area himself. But again, you, you can't accuse him any, of any of that this season. He's, he's, he's done. He's, he's worked wonders. Um, should we should we give up the ghost on on Henry playing for for England with with Southgate in control? And because you know some the, his selections today have been a couple of them are bizarre. So you know mm. what would you would you think, Charlie? Yeah, I think it's always it's always really frustrating um, Rico not getting in. I mean, obviously 
touch wood it won't happen, but he was, he's been a slightly linked with a move to Man United uh, in the last few weeks. And part of me almost wanted him to go so that finally people understood quite how good Rico Henry is. Because um, obviously, as soon as he'd signed for United, I think he'd be in the England squad um, as, as soon as the next squad was, was announced, really. So it's it's one of those things, I think, as you said, I think it's it's not at all a shock. I think Gareth is clearly... I don't know if he just trusts players too much. I mean, how Maguire and Calvin Phillips have got in when they've, they've probably played about three games between them over the last season. Um, I've got no idea. But, yeah, it, it's really disappointing. And I think with Shaw being injured, it made a lot of sense to take Rico. Um, and, and the other thing is, you know, you, you can take a player, as he did with Tony, and not even play him. But the experience of taking someone along, giving him that exposure to the England camp, I think it would have been really, really good for Rico. And, and, and it is a shame, because I think for me, He's easily one of the top left backs in the league, um, and and you know he's he's uh, controversially I'd say he's, he's probably slightly better than Luke Shaw anyway, irrespective of his injury. Um, so it's it's a real shame that unfortunately, as you said, it's it's just what we've come to expect from Mr Southgate. Um, but 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 yeah, we'll see. I'm sure we'll get in there at some point. But but inevitably, just after he signed for <laughs> for a bigger club. How about you, Mark? What's your thoughts on the subject? I feel, I feel slightly differently uh, to Charlie about this because um, for me, um, Rico has started the season sensationally well. And I think he has started to deal with the reason why he hasn't made the squad, which is end product. I think end product is the reason he hasn't been picked. And I think it's right that he hasn't been picked. So it might be a controversial view amongst a lot of Bees fans, but you know, speaking to people on the terraces at G Tech, I don't think I'm alone in feeling this way because when he does break past that last man, often he doesn't pick the right ball, and often he doesn't use it as well as other um, you know attacking fullbacks in around in around the national team do. But this season, we've already seen him. Uh, put that right twice, I think. Once in pre-season in the States and um, and again, I think, in the, in the Fulham game, I think, if I'm right, where, you know, he has burst past using that undeniable pace, but there has been that final ball and that end product. And I think that's what Southgate uh, is looking at. And I think if he carries on in the way he started this season, then it is undeniable that Rico will make the England squad because of his pace. Okay, that's that's no, no, that's that's you know that's a that's a rounded uh, you know take on the on the situation. Yeah, you know, I, I I think he I think from the form so far this season he deserves his chance. But you know perhaps it's uh, perhaps a phone call has gone in and, and Southgate said you know you carry this on. I can't ignore you. Um, maybe it's maybe it's the following window. It's not it's not now or never, is it? Let's be honest. Uh, mm. You know, I'm just looking at players. You know, people like Levi Colwell who who is literally played you know three games for us three games for Chelsea you know he's, he's, he's already played for him you know um, and, and 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 Brighton and he's, he's just I don't know has, has he earned has he earned that right over over Rico and I know they're not you know they're not like for like in position but I just I, I just think there are players within that team in that squad that you know that you know, people like Jordan Henderson now, and you know, as, as as Charlie said, you know, you've obviously got Harry Maguire in there, and Calvin Phillips. I mean, they've they've certainly not earned their their place in that in that um, squad on, on on merit. So, you know, I think it's harsh on harsh on Rico. Yeah, it is. It's undeniably harsh. Um, you know, to see as you say, Colwell in there, um, it is surprising. But you know, I think most pundits have said. Um, time and time again, that he's probably one of the best one-on-one -on -one, um, defenders in the Premier League. Um, I just think um, in international football, when we do break forward with the wide players, we do need end product. And you know, Rico's journey in football, you know, it's it's humbling, it's incredible. Um, but we haven't seen him play against top quality European opposition yet. And I just think um, probably when we get in and around the Europa Cup um, and he starts going up against good quality opposition in international, you know, players, um, you know, in European games and stuff like that. It's, it's just going to be impossible for Southgate to ignore him because of his other strengths. But that end product is the key for Rico. If he deals with that by Christmas, I think he'll get in. 
So the two fixtures that we're talking about for England is uh, we're in Poland um, for a match against Ukraine on Saturday the 9th of September. And then that's followed up uh, on the Tuesday at Hampden for um, a match, an old, an old school match with Scotland. That's to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the first friendly. Um, so that's that's uh, there'll be a couple of interesting games which you'd hope we will win both of, but um, you're never quite sure at the moment that uh, the you know the team. But there you go. We'll see what happens. <laughs> We have to now move on to the transfer window because the whole of the footballing world is talking about it. Talk sport are in meltdown. Sky Sports News are in meltdown. Five Live are in meltdown. There's, there'll be podcasts galore coming out, all of them outdated for almost the minute they get published because it seems that there's going to be transfers right up until the the right up until the, the, the window slams shut, as Jim White used to say. Um, we've been linked with a fair few names in the, in the, in the transfer window. Um, not many of them, obviously, apart from the ones that we've already got, you know, the Fleckens and the, um, the Collins, that which we did kind of our business early. We got Saman Godos back this week. Now, hands up if you saw that one coming, lads. <laughs> doesn't 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 work on in an audio form, but there's no I can see no hands in the air. No hands are up. No, no hands in the air. The return of Saman Godos, you know, he's a very popular player amongst the players. Um, the jury was really out amongst the the fans. He, he, never, he never really let us down, but you know, we ch- we chased him for a couple of transfer windows. Um, once it didn't, it went, you know, there was lots of agent shenanigans involved and a medical and that didn't happen. Then we went back in for him and, and we got him the next window. He didn't really, I don't think we ever saw what anyone saw in him, to be honest. He was, as I said, he was, he was a, he was a hard, a fairly hard working player, but he didn't really have a position. And he, he covered at left back, he covered at right back, he covered up front. He was like, he was a utility player the way we used him. But I don't think he, that's not what we bought him, I don't think. Um, but he just reminded, seeing him kind of announced as a, in the transfer window when everyone's expecting something else to happen, just reminded me of Bob Booker coming back in, in 1993, whenever it was. We 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 you know we'd sell our goodbyes to Bob and he got uh, he went off to Sheffield United in the top flight and we thought he, you know became a firm fa- pra- firm fan favourite up there they love Bob Booker um, and so do we and then uh, you know we 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 just lost Dean Holdsworth and we were we 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 had gone up to the top you know the second tier um, you know it was a championship and we were struggling and we were expecting sort of some big names to come in and some we we were crying out for some for some extra faces and then um, Bob Booker was announced and again not not knocking Bob because he's a he's a lovely bloke and he's a good friend of ours at the side but he wasn't what we were expecting and Samam Godos wasn't what we were expecting Charlie is that, is it a bit of a no-brainer because he knows the system and we just need we just need some cover or is that a kind of is it a kind of should, shouldn't we have gone back I I personally I think it was it was always gonna I think it was always gonna be an underwhelming signing uh, when you re-sign a player that we had the goodbye ceremony to uh, a couple of months ago. Um, also at that ceremony, it very much felt like he was sort of rushed a bit, and then it was onto the Pontus goodbye. So it felt a bit weird at the time, anyway. Um, but I think with the injuries to Baptiste and De Silva, I think it makes a lot of sense. As you said, he knows the system, he knows the squad. He's not going to come in. I think he, he's probably fully aware that his role is going to be that utility player who can come on at left back, come on in goal, come up on top. It, it could be anywhere. Um, but I think the signing itself makes a lot of sense uh, because he, he, you know, he does know the system. Granted, he certainly didn't set the world alight in his first spell here. But I think, you know, he's a player that can come in, come off the bench occasionally, and, and hopefully do a bit more than he did last time. Um, but yeah, I think the way we're playing this year might even suit him a bit more. Obviously, slightly more. Slightly less kind of direct football up to Ivan. Um, slightly more intricate. Who knows? It might suit him really well. Um, but yeah, it was an underwhelming one. But actually, after a bit of reflection, uh, I think it's actually quite a smart move. Um, and, and I presume that he was basically struggling to find another club. Um, and then the two injuries came and, and we gave him a call to, to come back. So 
yeah, I think it's one of those that, that, that makes a lot of sense and hopefully does a bit more than first time round. We did that with Zanka as well, Mark, didn't we? We kind of we went we went back and, and sort of you know we we we, we knew him. He, he 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 knows us. We know him. Um, is 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 within that circle of trust, and you know it's uh, obviously it's a different situation. We weren't going to give him a new contract, but we probably would have kept him if you know it, 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 that it, that's the way it's that's the way it's worked out, isn't it? It's, it's almost like you know he's, he's he's come back to us, and it's not really cost us anything. Yeah, completely agree. Um, I mean, it's interesting that like these days um, we don't hear too much about um, you know players' injuries. I guess for tactical reasons, and we don't want other clubs knowing too much about you know what's happened. So, so I guess seeing got us back has made me think that maybe De Silva's um, hamstring or knock is perhaps a little bit more serious than perhaps we we hoped. Um, but you know, I mean. I can remember a really dreary away game up at Burnley and the only bright spark was an amazing scissor kick from Goros from the edge of the edge of the D. Um, and I remember reading that um, Arsene Wenger when he was younger, I think he played against Arsenal in the Champions League in a group game and he completely ran, ran the game from midfield and Wenger was raving about him. So for me, I think he's a number eight. I think he's, he's a sort of Matty Henson um, player. Uh, but we've just never really been able to play him there uh, because because we've got Matty. So, as you say, probably um, his attitude is so good, he's happy to be playing, um, that he's valuable because Thomas can pick him, um, as you say, in a number of positions and he's, 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 he's bang up for it and his attitude is great and the players love to have him on board. So that is valuable, right? And the no dickheads policy thing is super valuable. Yeah, no, I'm 100. So yeah, no, no one, no one's knocking him. It's just that we, that we weren't, we weren't expecting the return of Simon Golos, and um, you know, ho- hopefully he can come in and uh, he can, uh, you know, be called upon as and when required. We, he didn't, didn't make the squad, didn't travel. I don't think um, down to Newport. He wasn't on the bench, so um, you know, mm-hmm. um, maybe he's not fit. I don't know. Anyway, we we move on there. The one player that we we definitely put in a, a massive bid for, as as we've said earlier, is Johan Bakayoko. Uh, he's a he's a young Belgian um, player with with PSV Eindhoven forward. Looks looks very similar to um, to you know the the, uh, the winger stroke striker situation we have. Maybe that's the kind of player that we want. He doesn't look a lot different. Um, to uh, to both uh, Mbumo and to Sharda uh, in the way you can drop a shoulder and, and cut inside and, and, and unleash a shot. Um, so and then but he, he, he did a completely different build to Wisa. So 34.2 million euros is the is the um, amount of money that we've put in. I've got a feeling that the language that the reporting is is using is this is a a, a deal that the players interested in, um, PSV are interested in, and the bid is serious. I think it rises to 40 million euros with add-ons and performance-related bonuses, etc. Uh, he, he looks an incredibly exciting player. Uh, he played in the match against um, Glasgow Rangers last night out in Eindhoven, and they they demolished. Rangers uh, and apparently he played um, absolutely brilliantly in that. Uh, are you excited about this one, Mark? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, there's also talk about um, another guy, uh, Bradley Barcola from Leon, also 20 years old, also a winger. So for me, um, this is making me think that the club realised that Ivan Tony is going to go in January and that um, we got a move um, Sade through the middle and we need a replacement for Sade on the left or um, we need to move um, move our wide players around and use someone who's you know on the right side so for me it's starting to show me that Phil Giles realizes that the writing's on the wall about Ivan and Ivan won't play for Brentford club again which I'm sad about um, but I think that's what the player wants and I think the club you know we know what the, the club's mentality is that they, they want to act now they want to be ready um, so I think that's why we're seeing these big bids go in for these wide players because they know that Sade is gonna is gonna go through the middle and gonna is gonna replace Ivan. 
and, and Charlie, you know, um, we've had a, lot, a couple of other big bids that, you know, that it doesn't look like they're going to come to fruition. You know, Brennan Johnson is someone that we've been after for consecutive transfer windows. I think we bid mid 30s, 30 millions for him. It looks like Tottenham are going to get that player. Personally, I'm happy for them to get that player. I, I still don't see. I, I mean, obviously, I see lots of good in him, but every time I watch him play in the Premier League, he, I'm thinking, really? Um, okay, he does a couple of good things, but not not to the same level as you know a Brian and Bumo, who I, I I I can't say anything. I, you know, there are no more superlatives for Brian for me at the moment. I just think he's he's turned in he's turned into like such a mature, experienced, exciting player. You know, if if Brennan Johnson is is worth 40, then 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 Mbumo has got to be worth you know, double that, um, to, in my opinion. Um, and the other the other transfer target that we've kind of been in on a lot is uh, Nico Gonzalez from um, Fiorentina, who they they don't seem to want to sell him, and he doesn't seem to want to come. So the combination of those two things um, um, does, doesn't mean the transfer is going to, to to get close. We've been in for others, I think, but. You know this 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 Bakayoko deal, Charlie. It, I get a good vibe about this one. How about you? Yeah, it's it's one of those where I'm going in pretty blind. I've never watched him properly, but for some reason, I'm convinced we've just signed a future Ballon d'Or winner. Uh, there's something about him. When I've watched him on YouTube, he, he just looks he, he looks class. And, and yeah, I watched a bit of the game last night just to, to do a bit of a scouting mission, and he and he did look really really good. Um, I think, as Mark said, I think he's one of those where he very much kind of fits the mould of the players that we're looking to sign. And, and, you know, it's almost surreal that he's at PSV who have just qualified for the Champions League and he's potentially moving on down to West London um, to, to come and play for the for the Bees. Um, it has actually, in the last 40 minutes, I've, I've seen, apparently, they're sort of expecting to sell because um, they've got a replacement lined up already over at PSV. So it's looking like it's, it's quite likely to get done. Um, okay. According to a certain popular Twitter agent, um, okay. who shall remain nameless, obviously. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a really exciting one, and, and I think t- to me he very much fits the mould of, of the players that we would usually sign. It just probably feels a bit more exciting because we're paying so much money for him. But I think it's just kind of a, an evolution of us now being in the Premier League and being able to attract these players who are already at top clubs. Um, and, and you know, I think it's it's a landmark signing in a way if it all comes through. Touch yeah, it, 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 it would be, yeah. I certainly don't want to jinx that. And um, it's, it's I, well, I just get a, I just get a slight feeling that we're still a little bit light with with the two with the two injuries in midfield, as you, as you said a minute ago, Charlie. And um, yeah, we, we've got this perennial um, cover cover for Rico that we don't really don't really have. Um, you know, we've got players that can play there, but we haven't got a we haven't got a real left back number two. Uh, and I, and you know, it, it would appear that the, the the powers that be would prefer players that are wingers that can be converted to centre forwards than really an, an out and out an out and out number nine. Who that's 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 what they do. Um, I think we need. Well, of course, you can understand why you want players that have got flexibility, and you know you, they're not not utility, but you know you, you can you can cause havoc by by as Mark said earlier. We 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 had a fluid forward line. The defenders don't really know who they're picking up. The patterns of play are so intelligent and intricate. They work on them all all week, and then they know what they're doing. You know, I don't I don't think come. Um, Thomas is holding up numbers like little sequences yet on the side on his little whiteboard. But you know, we we, we underestimate how intelligent these, these footballers are, and you know they're, they're, they're able to um, they're able to um, bamboozle some of the best defenders in the land. You, and, and Charlie, so you know, do you, do you think that we're we're light, or do you think we're you know the squad's going to cope all right? Well, uh, yeah, I was going to say, it's one of those things, I feel like every single transfer window, at least for kind of the last seven, eight years, there have been a few glaring gaps that everyone has felt that we need to sign someone who can cover it. And I think so far, we've probably been quite lucky. Um, You know, Rico's obviously had that really bad injury when he first started and then we missed him a bit, I think, in the first year in the Prem, a couple of games. But he... You know, he's a, there's, there's definitely some areas on the pitch where we're a bit light, but I think the club fully know, you know, 
if there was one club to get it right, it seems like our club do, and they have done in the last few windows. And when it's felt like we've needed a replacement, we've we've kind of just kept getting stronger and stronger. Um, so yeah, I think you know, I think we've clearly got a lot of faith in a lot of players in the B team, players who can step up and, and do a job. Um, you know, in an ideal world, I think yes, I'd quite like to definitely go out and get another left back and also maybe another centre mid. But you know, I think one of the main things that Thomas has is he's got a happy squad, and and you know, if you bring in too many players, it can be difficult to rotate people. Players are going to get unhappy, and 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 yeah, it, it, it certainly feels that we're lightweight. But you know, it's felt like that every summer, um, and we've and we've done all right so far. How about you, Mark? Well, I, th- I think there is a lot of flexibility in our players. You know, um, I mean, Aaron Hickey, you know, he's so two-footed, isn't he, that I think he is um, able to slot in and cover for Rico on the left. Um, I think he played on the left in the, his previous club, I think, if I remember right. So, I mean, I feel like um, the players that we tend to sign are adaptable and the club probably has got, you know, one or two if not three different visions about how they could use those players. So I just feel um, the other thing worth mentioning as well is, you know, um, the way we um, turned Ollie Watkins from a left-sided midfielder into a striker over a couple of seasons. So, you know, that coaching team is still at the club and I just feel like we've got the know-how. We know how to make wide players effective um, centre forwards in the Premier League. So, um, I think that we'll be happy to do it again. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to overlook um, Yarmouk because he, he's, he was someone that um, he seems to be really rated. He's been um, like promoted up into the, the proper 18 this, this season and he's, he, he played a couple of really good games or one particularly good game out in the States. And he had a he had a solid he had a solid 90, well not 90 minutes but he had a he had a good run out against uh, Newport the other night. Um, p- part of me is obviously a little bit frustrated that the the, the serendipity the, the revolving of the the, the the revolving doors didn't quite align for Mads Bistrup because I think if he hadn't been sold to uh, to Red Bull a few weeks back. It will be a really good opportunity now. We do need centre midfielders, and he, he was he was a cracking one. Um, but you, you understand kind of why the decisions were made at that time. I do. I did. I just sort of honourable mention for uh, for Brearley. You know, yes, of course, a good shout. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's, bro- he's broken in in the most impressive way, hasn't he? I mean, every time that that lad has been on the pitch, he's sort of demanding the ball at his feet. And um, I don't know. I just you know. Having watched watched Brentford for a long time, I'm really excited about him. I mean, he really, he really feels like he's got something to me. Um, never seen such a young guy demand the ball from experienced players like he does. Um, so you know, maybe the club know that um, they've got they've got someone coming through there that you know they really rate, they really fancy. Yeah, he really has seized his his opportunities, hasn't he? You know, the the preseason game against Lille, and then um, um, the other night against Newport. Yeah, he he looks every bit a comfortable, um, you know, composed midfielder there. Probably he's he's really surprised them as well. I think you know they obviously they they knew he's good, but did they really know that he was going to seize it like like he has? And uh, yeah, you know, long long may that continue. So yeah, so I mean we've got. We're recording this on Thursday evening, so with Friday, Friday night, the, the dead, you know, is the deadline. So there's still plenty of time for stuff to happen. We're not expecting anyone to go, but you never know. Um, and we're expecting one, if not two, players in. Um, three would be uh, would be really good, but um, you know, it's 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 you know, it's, it's not. We haven't got to spend money just for the sake of it, but you know, we've, as we've highlighted, we have got injuries. We have got the African nations coming up in January. Um, there, 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 there is cover required, but then you know we have got uh, you know rookie talent coming through. But you know, do you want do you want that in the in the Premier League? Do you want to do you want to be risking that? You know, yeah, it's the way we do things. But um, I'm sure there's some more experience coming through um, before the deadline. Uh, do you, do you think um, you know 
we've got this situation as well. I mean, it's, well, I'm not going to take it too much broader than Brentford, but one of, one of the biggest stories is like Mo Salah potentially going to, to Saudi Arabia. You know, they, they seem to be coming in for some of the biggest names in, in, um, in the Premier League. Do you, do, you, do you think that it actually could work in Brentford's favour at some stage? Because the, the, top, the top dogs in the Prem, they seem to be having it all their own way with the talent and the, and the money. And all of a sudden, you've got Saudi Arabia coming into this. Um, you know, we talk about the politics and the, you know, the, 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 you know, the morals of, of all of that. But you can't doubt that they are buying up a lot of talent. And that, that could actually get bigger and that actually could... You know, really change the power of, of the world game. Do you think, Mark? Yeah, I, I, that makes a lot of sense to me. It's like supply and demand, isn't it? I mean, we've suddenly got. Um, and the interesting thing about Saudi um, league is it's actually the league that signs the players, and then they assign the signing to a team, don't they? So, God knows how that works. But um, so you've got a hungry league to try to get themselves a Champions League spot, and they're all out to sort of. You know, buy top talent, aren't they, from the Premiership uh, to try and make try and make that league, you know, top ten league in the world. So, um, to me, that's pulling some of the talent out of the Premiership because of the salaries on offer. And we are working on um, supplying that demand, aren't we? Um, we're unearthing these young gems, and they're going to be very attractive uh, to clubs with um, Saudi-sized gaps to fill, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, Charlie, would you get out of bed for £1.5 million a week? Yeah, uh, I wouldn't need much convincing, to be honest. I think I'd be over in Saudi as soon as you could, as soon as you could put me a flight. Uh, but uh, it is weird. It's one of those weird things. I think it's, it feels like it's a bit of a shame for football seeing all these really good players go off to Saudi. But I think, unfortunately, it's probably the way the game's headed. Um, and you're right. I think there's a lot of clubs, us and Brighton, um, other honourable mentions, I'm sure, but you know, there's going to be some clubs that can take advantage of it where maybe Saudi think our players probably aren't being paid enough to justify the huge contracts they're giving out. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's exciting for us. Um, I will say my my FPL team will be absolutely devastated if Salah does go. Uh, going to have to be some big transfers in. Um, but but yeah, I think it you know it's a it's a shame um, that, that the Premier League are losing these players, but also you know as you said, the big, big teams have had it their own way for so long, and it's. You know, hopefully a bit of an equaliser. Um, not that they particularly need one at Brentford because we've done quite well against big teams anyway. Yeah. Um, and last, but, yeah. before we move on out of the transfer talk, um, you know the Arsenal, the Arsenal draw um, in the in the you know Caribou Cup, the League Cup, we'll see David Raya, David Raya's Arsenal come come to uh, G Tech. <laughs> there's, there's technically he can he can he can play in it, Mark. I, I understand whether he will or not. We'll see. That's what I've read online, yeah. I mean, it was such a unique um, transfer deal, wasn't it? The construction of that deal was was something else. So I'm pretty sure he's not cup-tied. And yeah, I mean, I think probably um, Arteta will probably play him as the cup goalkeeper. Otherwise, why did he buy him, quite frankly? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I think we probably will um, be able to wind him up at the GTEC, And I think we will. <laughs> Wind him up for the G Tech. I think there'll be a lot of your shits from the goal kicks, and I think he will. He will love it. I think he will enjoy it, and I think it'll all be done in good spirits. And um, he's hugely admired at Brentford, isn't he? And rightly so. So, but I do think he will. He will get the maximum. <laughs> He'll get the full rap. Of the West End. Yeah. <laughs> Charlie, should it, should he have stayed with a big club? Because I'm sure that's going to be sung. Absolutely, absolutely, he should have done. Um, yeah, what, I think, what, what, what kind of reception is he going to get? Kind of serious I think question. he's. I mean, he's obviously going to get a bad reception. I don't think it's at all. It, I think there <laughs> might be. I think he'll get an applause when his name comes out initially. To be honest, uh, but then I think it will be straight down to business as soon as it kicks off. Straight down um, to business. Gloves are yeah. straight off after that. Exactly, exactly. For, for me, anyway, I'd have actually been way more annoyed if he signed for Spurs. To me, him going to Arsenal actually vaguely makes a bit of sense as the goalkeeping coach link. He'll actually play European football. Um, so I didn't hate the transfer. Obviously, he should have stayed at a big club, but but I'm sure we'll give him an absolute absolute hammering uh, on Saturday, <laughs> which I've won. We'll, we'll surely be joining in with. But I look forward to cringing at, at that. You know, yeah. it, was, it, was, it does. I mean, on a, on a 
on a different kind of magnitude this year, but you know, it did rem kind of cringe when uh, Ericsson came back with Man United. I was just like, yeah, I did, you know, it was one. like I was like laughing and cringing and, <laughs> and, and and joining in all at the same time. It was just yeah. like, you know, that's that's the that's the joy of football, isn't it? It's like you can you know you can have a hero that you love, and then the minute they move, that you absolutely absolutely bait the hell out of them so it's like, <laughs> <laughs> brilliant yeah and no, i look forward to that under the under the floodlights in a, in a couple couple of weeks time so is it you know also as well with the the cup draw i used to uh always be looking out for you know all the times we we're in the lower leagues yearning for a for a big big draw like this you know arsenal or chelsea or what we had last year or the year before no, no year before and um, now I'm thinking, oh god, just win some more shit, just so we can get through. Yeah. To, because I was always Arsenal came out, it's like, oh well, oh, oh, well, we've got to play Arsenal again. You know, yeah. not, not that you know, it's not a, it's not a hardship to play Arsenal again. Is that actually all want to go quite deep into this tournament, and you know, we stand a better chance of getting well. We, we said that when we got Gillingham last year, so yeah, you just play whoever. We have got we got the beating of Arsenal, so uh, yeah, br bring them on, bring them on. So talking of bringing it on. We've got um, we've got Bournemouth at the weekend. It's, it's actually it's the, probably the as a as a neutral as a as a Saudi Arabian citizen, it's the least glamorous Premiership fixture <laughs> of, of the season. I would have thought um, uh, there was a lot of tickets floating around uh, for the Crystal, Crystal Palace last uh, last Saturday. I think I don't think anyone's going to struggle to get a ticket for the Bournemouth match. And that's, and I, I said that to the Bournemouth guys. I'm not actually you know I'm not I'm not sort of da down talking them. It's just. Uh, you know, it's um, it's 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 been a, a really sort of hectic first few weeks of the season. It's school holidays, etc. So, um, is there anyone that wants a ticket, there's, there's just sniff around online. There's plenty going, but it, it should it's it should be a really really excellent game of football. They're, they're, they've got a new manager that really likes to play attacking football. They've got an exciting team. Um, they're very similar to to us in in terms of you know their their sort of punk, uh, you know punching above their weight and they're one of the least glamorous teams in the Prem but they're there on merit and they've got some as I said some excellent players what what are you thinking on, on Saturday don't give don't give us your, your predictions yet because we, we'll go away and we'll uh, we're going to talk to um, we're going to talk to Matt from Up The Cherries podcast in a minute but what's, what's your vibe going into the game Mark well I I think in some ways it will be similar to the Palace game um, and I hope we kind of learn a little bit from from the tempo in that second half because I think we'll have to be on it and um, we'll have to play, move the ball quickly and, and, and try to take control of that game and dominate. Um, so I just hope that the players, you know, I think it's a mindset thing really. I think, you know, we can get up for the big, for the top six and, you know, we need to be up for these um, these winnable games. That's three points that, you know, uh, could be three massive steps on the way to European football for us. So um, I want to see him fly out of the traps in the front of the first half and in the front of the second half. And, um, and you know, you know, dominate, really. We're at home. We've got to win that. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, they've, they've had a tricky start to the season. Um, they, they've taken one point from their three matches. Uh, West Ham at home was a draw, and then they lost to Liverpool and Spurs. You could argue that they've had um, a really tough start. They 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 won. But we we were in South Wales, and so were they on Tuesday. They they got a three-two win at Swansea, and we got a penalty win at Newport. But let's 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 go. Oh, actually, let's, let's hear from let's hear, let's hear from Matt before we speak to uh, Charlie. Matt. This Matt is uh, he, he runs up the cherries podcast and he's going to tell us everything that's going on down at whatever you call it now Dean Court Vital, 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 Vitality Stadium is it or it's he's had loads of names but I'm going to call it Dean Court take it away Matt Hi I'm Matt and I'm from up the cherries in all departments. Um, obviously, we are a AFC Bournemouth-based um, podcast. Um, we're on YouTube, Spotify, also part of the TalkSport uh, fan network. Um, but um, on our channel, we've got all sorts of things from weekly um, our weekly podcast, Cherry Picking, to interviews with past players, managers and chairmen. Um, for example, we've had Harry Redknapp, who's a good friend of the channel. He comes on are quite regular 
Um, we've had Charlie Daniels, um, Steve Cook, um, club legend Steve Fletcher, as well as other players like um, Luther Blissett, um, who obviously played for Bournemouth in the very, very early 90s, late 80s. Um, so, yeah, that's a little bit about what the channel is. Um, last season, um, overall, got to say happy with it because we stayed in the league. Um, that was the brief um, at the start was to stay up, um, which we managed to do. Obviously, um, we had a transition period with new ownership as well amongst all of that. So it was a little bit up and down in terms of um, things going on at the club. Um, I mean, to give it like a mark out of 10, you're probably looking at, I mean, with performances as well, I mean, you know, a five out of 10. Um, we did the bare minimum, um, really. Um, obviously, with the new ownership uh, comes um, the manager's position. Um, Gary O'Neill was given the manager's position um, in January time on a on a 14 month deal. Um, for me, I always believed that the um, new ownership would would make a change of manager uh, during the summer. Um, he was kind of appointed right on the transition period so i think it was kind of an agreement between sort of the previous owner um the technical director and and with a little bit of input from the incoming owner um so i always felt that he would make the change um it, it, people say it was unfair that he was he was dismissed and i can see why they say that um, I actually made the call on one of our podcasts in January saying that, you know, the new the new regime would, would make a change, which which they did. Um, but, you know, we've got to be thankful to Gary O'Neill. Um, you know, he did the job. He picked up a side that were very, very deflated by the previous manager. Um, he, he picked up uh, the guys and, and turned out a 0-0 draw straight after being hammered 9-0 by Liverpool. And the players seemed like they wanted to play for him. Um, to be fair, not all performances were great. Um, there was probably substitutions where, you know, we questioned why is he taking him off and bringing him on, like we all do as football fans. Um, but there, there was just something with it that just didn't quite make sense um, sometimes with substitutions. Um, and as for the last four performances of the season, um, I understand he was trying out new um, like tactics and players, trying out different players in different positions and stuff, but the performances were really, really poor. Um, so, like I say, I'll always be thankful to Gary O'Neill for, for doing a good job by keeping the club in the Premier League, but overall, I don't think he was um, really somebody that... that the new ownership really wanted in place um the new season um the first few matches obviously we've played uh west ham uh, we've played liverpool at anfield um uh, we've played tottenham at home and we've played swansea in the cup um bit of a mixed bag um there's there's some strong individual performances within the squad at the moment um for example um like David Brooks, uh, Justin Clivert, to name a couple, um, uh, Milos Kerkez. There's a lot of real talent in the squad now, um, but I think it's a case of where new a uh, new manager comes in um, and he's still trying to put his philosophy into the squad. Um, I think the squad is still adapting. They're adapting not only to a new manager, but to new signings coming in and they're adapting to their surroundings. Um, and the transfer window for us, I don't think is finished yet. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see another player come in. Um, and obviously some of the players we have signed are out injured as well. So um, it's been a little bit of a mixed bag for us, but there's been a lot of, lot of promising um, performances. Uh, West Ham, for example, Apart from probably, I would say, the first 10 minutes of each half, we were the better side, I would say, um, in terms of going forward. Um, we looked good. Um, we had chances that hit the bar, hit the post. So, you know, in theory, you know, on another day, we would have won that game. Um, Anfield, I mean, 
not many sides can go to Anfield and, and be 1-0 up within the first few minutes. Um, we could have been 2-0 up, um, but obviously we had a goal disallowed. Um, once their equaliser went in, we, we kind of lost it a little bit, but we're still going at them. Um, and that's the thing with, with the new manager. It's a case of um, you, you score two, we're going to score three mentality. So, um, yeah, it's... Still very, very early days. Um, but I think maybe um, a couple of more signings in, in the transfer window. Maybe, definitely maybe another striker. Um, I'm very happy with what we've done in the transfer window over the last um, several weeks. Uh, bringing in a talent like Alex Scott, for example, um, is, is a real big coup and obviously um, Tyler Adams, um, the USA captain coming in, um, is going to really add to that midfield um, because obviously we've lost Jess Jefferson Lerma who's obviously gone to Crystal Palace so hopefully Adams can fill that void um, but yeah, it's, it's been a good good window Max Ahrens has come in uh, from Norwich um, great little player um, Miles Kirke is, like I said, a Hungarian international left back, only 19 years of age, but he's got a real mature footballing head on his shoulders. Um, and like I say, I don't think our window's finished yet. I think I'm hoping we, we get another another player in before the deadline hits. Um, so, in terms of the squad, I, I, I'm comfortable with the squad. Um, for this season um, but I think we just need to add a striker in my personal opinion um, we've got a lot of wingers a lot of players that can play in behind the front man but I think I think Dom Solanke needs some real competition this season um, I believe we can build on it um, from last year um, for me if we're changing manager um, which we have done, then surely we've got to put in a better performance than what we put in last season overall. So I would expect us to finish higher up the league um, to justify changing the manager. Um, players, there's a lot of players that excite us as well in, in the squad at the minute. I mean, Justin Cliver, um, great little player. Um, you've got other players as well, like David Brooks, who I've mentioned. Um, Billing, uh, Philip, um, he can be a, a very excitable player. Um, the whole squad as a whole, um, once they gel, will be a real good attacking force. Um, I think that um, with the new additions, it's definitely, definitely going to improve us to, to to build on last season. Um, but I mean, the main players really, I think. You know, Brentford need to to watch out for would will, will be the likes of Philip, um, Justin Cliver, David Brooks, um, Samanie. Um, they're probably the the main ones in terms from an attacking threat. Um, but defensively, you know, you have got some good defenders in there now um, as well. So, but they'd be the front three from an attacking. Uh, point of view that, that you guys probably need to um, keep a tab off. Um, in terms of um, you guys um, beating us um, at your new stadium last season, um, and, and obviously we had a we had a draw at, at our place, um, Brentford. Um, are a side that seem to, for me, I mean, I'm very, very intrigued by their manager. Um, I think he's he's quite a, quite a special guy, to be honest, um, in terms of what he's achieved at uh, Brentford. Um, I was impressed with Brentford last year. I mean, I, I remember watching the Manchester United game at, at, at your home ground um, and... I know United probably weren't the best on their day, but I mean, Brentford tore them apart. Um, so I've got to say I'm impressed with Brentford, and I think, like most teams in the league, Brentford can beat anybody on their day. And um, 
with the players that they've brought in, I know they've lost a few, but with the players that they've brought in, I think they will probably achieve the same as last season, if not go one step better. Um, the players that are concerning for for us, um, obviously, at the minute, you guys haven't got um, Ivan Tony, which is one player less to, for us to have to worry about, which is um, a good thing. Um, I think the goalkeeper you've brought in um, is pretty decent, um, considering your keeper that you've um, sent out on loan to Arsenal. I thought he was outstanding, but um, I think you've replaced him well. Um, Kevin um, Kevin Shade, um, is it? Um, I believe his name is. Um, he looks um, exciting, an exciting player to watch. Um, definitely. Um, he does excite me. There's also um, like players like um, Rico Henry. I remember from the um, championship season, he, he was a very, very decent player. And um, I mean, I'm not too sure if he's still in your squad these days, but I mean, if he is, he's, he's definitely a, a cracking little player. Um, there's also um, with the, the forward line, um, uh, he plays mainly in midfield. I do forget his name. Um, I know he wears, I think it's, is it number nine he wears? I can't pronounce his name, but he's a cracking player as well. Um, so there's quite a few in, in the squad that you know we've got to be very, very wary of um, when we approach the game. Um, the game, the game and the score prediction. I mean, the game, I think... For us, I think you're going to see a different Bournemouth side to what you've seen previously. You're going to see a bit more of an out-and-out -out attacking Bournemouth side. Um, yes, you know, we, there's chances we're going to get hit on the break. Totally. Um, but, I mean, there'd be goals in the game. There'd definitely be goals in the game. Um, to give it a score prediction, I mean, I've got to have some faith in the side. I mean, things are still gelling together. Like I've said, you know, it's, it's exciting times for Bournemouth at the moment. Um, so I'm going to back us with a with a draw, um, which is going to be a, a great result if we can um, turn that out against you guys. Um, so I'm going to go with a 2-2 draw. Um, in terms of uh, the top four this season, um, I think the top four would consist of um, Arsenal, Man City... Liverpool and Man United. Um, I just think that um, those teams are, are probably a little bit stronger than where maybe Chelsea are at the moment. I think with European football coming to Newcastle, that's gonna. It'd be interesting to see how that pans out with the whole Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Sunday or Saturday game. It, it's gonna be interesting to see how they cope with that. So that's why I've picked those four. Um, in terms of relegation, um, for me, it's uh, Sheffield United, um, Luton Town and Wolverhampton. Um, Sheffield, I don't think, have done enough in the transfer window to strengthen. Luton, uh, probably in a similar position to where Bournemouth were when we first come up. Um, but I just can't see them staying up. I, I, they give a fight, they definitely give a fight, but I can't see them staying up. Um, and um, Wolverhampton, um, even before Gary O'Neill went there, I tipped them to go down, um, and I still tip them to go down with him there, um, because they've lost so much quality. Um, I know they've had a result against uh, Everton recently, but I, I just think long term that they will um, go down. But um, yeah, it's been a pleasure to be able to record this for you guys. And, um, yeah, cheers from me. Thanks to Matt from Up The Cherries for his insight into all that's happening down on the south coast at AFC Bournemouth. Um, Charlie, what, what, where's your head at ahead of the weekend? It's, it's one of those games, Bournemouth, that I always go into it thinking we're absolutely going to chance them, but we never actually end up doing so. And it tends to be quite a cagey fixture. I, I, I might be completely wrong, but I think last time when we played them at home, we were actually quite lucky to get through it uh, get through it with a win. I think we got awarded quite a suspect penalty. Um, and yeah, it's one of those games that I'd like to think we'll absolutely steamroll them, but I just I, I don't think we will. 
Um, I think I agree with Mark. I think in terms of the way the game will go, it'll probably be quite similar to Palace. I think they'll be bang up for it. Um, but yeah, it's about kind of trying to do the same again, get a nice early goal and then actually try and build on it. Um, but yeah, I'm, feel, I'm feeling positive. But I think, you know, I, I, I definitely don't underestimate Bournemouth. As you said, there, they've got a lot of really good players. You know, it's the start of a new journey for them under a new manager. And, and then, you know, certainly not going to be a pushover. Um, but yeah, I'm going into it positive and, and likelihood. I think we'll, we'll probably get the win. With the help of Agent Mepham, I'm sure, I'm sure exactly. we, we can we can we can do that. So you, you go first, this you can go first, Charlie. Give us your, give us a score prediction. Uh, I'm going to go very bold, uh, and I'm going to say three-one Brentford. Sam and Godos hat trick. Uh, Mark, <laughs> sorry, compose myself after that. <laughs> I I think it will be tight. Um, I'm going to say two-one. Um, just wanted to mention uh, David Brooks. Um, he's first came back after cancer treatment uh, for them um, in the um, Carabao Cup in midweek. So yeah, if he plays, that'd be a nice moment, I think. Um, good players there, good forwards. Um, we know them well, right, from the playoffs. So I think 2-1. I, I think if we're on it, 2-1. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to copy you. 2-1 two, two, to us. But uh, yeah, again, we have to be on it because, you know, they're... You look at their, their fixtures, they'll, they'll probably be relieved to come to our place because it's the first winnable game they'll, they'll see. It. They, they've probably been you know, fairly confident against West Ham, but it's a different West Ham this season to last. So they're probably like thinking it's a bit of a relief to come to our place and you know they'll be confident of getting something out of it. Hopefully it's not three points, but they're more than capable of getting one, um, and they will win if we if we if we you know we, we're not on our A game. So uh, let's hope that doesn't happen. Um, well, I hope you've enjoyed tonight. It's been it's been a it's been a really like varied one, you know. Where it's, uh, it's, there's still a lot going on. As I said, we're we're recording this on Thursday with the uh, transfer deadline that doesn't actually finish until tomorrow. If anything massively significant happens, I'll obviously we'll do a, 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 an extra pod. Um, um, but um, um, hopefully we can get Bakayoko over the line because he's obviously someone that we we, we rate. And uh, having looking at the clips and seeing him, you know seeing some of the highlights against Rangers, he's, he's someone that's gonna you know put him in our team and, and give him the ball. He's gonna he's gonna cause havoc, and it's a, it's a very exciting forward lineup. I think if we, if we can add to what is already uh, a, a very exciting attacking lineup. Anyway, so thanks to Mark and to Charlie for for joining us tonight. Cheers, lads. Thanks very much. No problem. Um, uh, if you uh, like what we do, um, don't forget to subscribe to Besotted on all good podcast channels. We'll be back straight after the game against AFC Bournemouth and do a post-match pod where I'll be speaking to fans um, out, out, outside the ground, inside the ground and back at the Globe. Get yourself down to the Globe if you want a pre-match pint. It's a really, it's, a, it's, quite, it's still, I still think it's the best football pub. Um, in in Brentford, um, and it's you know it's only a 15 minute walk to to the new stadium. So get down there. Um, the, the games are in on before and after the match. Really big beer garden. Uh, really look after us well down there. So yeah, get yourself down to the Globe, and um, yeah, I'll see you next week. Come on, you bees. Come on, you bees. Come on, you bees. Come on, you bees.